Good evening and welcome back to Downing Street for today's coronavirus briefing. I'm joined by Chief Medical Officer Professor Chris Whitty and by Professor Steve Powis, the Medical Director of NHS England. The start of our COVID-19 vaccination programme on Tuesday was the latest in a long line of firsts for the NHS. Uh, the NHS was the first healthcare system in the world to roll out the vaccines for other deadly diseases like TB, measles, mumps and rubella, and meningitis C. So I'm proud that we can now add COVID-19 to that list. Before updating you on vaccine deployment, I'd like to go through the latest coronavirus data. Uh, the average number of new cases each day is now 16,236, and that has risen over the last week. Today, there are 15,242 COVID patients in hospital across the UK, which is slightly less than last week. And sadly, 516 deaths were reported yesterday. And the fall in the number of cases has flattened off and is rising in some parts of the country, like Kent and Essex and some parts of London. And this shows us that this fight is not over and how we must all play our part and stay on our guard now and through Christmas. We've got help on the horizon and we can all see that with the vaccine. So don't blow it now. And of course, this shows why the deployment of the vaccine is so important. I just want to take a moment to thank everybody involved in the vaccine rollout so far, which has been done with such professionalism and skill. Today, I want to pay special tribute and thank pharmacists who are working with such a, a tricky uh, vaccine, must be kept cold at minus 70 degrees. Um, and they've done so much work to get ready for this moment at such pace. As of today, we're vaccinating in 73 hospitals across the UK. Tens of thousands of people have had the jab, and I want to set out the next steps. I can confirm that we'll shortly expand our vaccination program further to 10 more locations in England. And from next week, we plan to begin vaccinations in GP-led sites and vaccinate in care homes by Christmas. We'll keep on expanding this rollout to reach more and more people. As more vaccines come on stream, we'll open vaccination centres in larger venues like sports stadia and conference halls next year. And that's when most people can expect to get their jabs. When the time comes, the NHS will get in touch with you. So you don't need to come forward and get into contact with the NHS. On Tuesday in Milton Keynes, it was great to meet some of the patients and the staff involved. Uh, and I love what Barbara, who's 82, said when she got her jab there. She said, I'd much rather get the vaccine than COVID-19 itself. I'm with Barbara. It's free according to need, and it's the very best way to protect you and to protect those around you. And when enough people get vaccinated and we see those hospitalisation numbers coming down, we can then start lifting the restrictions which have made this year so tough. I felt really proud uh, when I saw uh, Mohammed Hassan, and I sat with him as he got his jab. Uh, he's a doctor at Milton Keynes uh, Hospital who volunteered to treat COVID patients and himself caught COVID in the first peak. And he said that the jab was painless, but he also talked about the challenges that we face right now whilst we roll out the jab right across the country. Even with this mass vaccination program underway, for the next few months, we will not have sufficient protection through the vaccination program. And this is always the most difficult time for the NHS anyway in the winter months. And with the number of cases flattening again, we've all got to do our bit and not put more pressure on the NHS. To do that, we must keep respecting the rules where we are and take those sensible steps that we can all take, like washing our hands, covering our face, and making space between people, respecting that social distancing and the rules that come with it. We can't stop doing that now just because the vaccine is here. And even if you've had the jab, you're not immune because the vaccine will not 
fully protect you until seven days after you've received the second dose. And we don't yet know if it'll stop you from passing on the disease to other people. So we have to all keep acting as if we can still pass it on. And that is the safest way to get the number of cases down and keep people safe. I'm particularly concerned about the number of cases in London, Kent and Essex. Cases are rising and in many areas already high. Looking into the detail, the testing results and surveys show us that by far the fastest rise is amongst secondary school-aged children, 11 to 18 years old, while the rate amongst adults in London is broadly flat. But we know from experience that a sharp rise in cases in younger people can lead to a rise amongst more vulnerable age groups later. We've seen that happen before. So we need to do everything we can to stop the spread amongst school-age children in London right now. We must not wait until the review, which will take place on the 16th of December. We need to take targeted action immediately. Having spoken to the leaders of uh, London's councils and to the mayor, we've decided to put in place an immediate plan for testing all secondary school-age children in the seven worst affected boroughs of London, in parts of Essex that border London, and parts of Kent. We want to keep schools open, because that's both right for education and right for public health. We're therefore surging mobile testing units, and we'll be working with schools and local authorities to encourage these children and their families to get tested over the coming days. More details will be set out tomorrow. I want to urge all those involved to step forward for the testing. It's important that 11 to 18 year olds get tested in these boroughs irrespective of whether they have symptoms. And this is a really important point because we know that you can have COVID and you can still pass it on even without symptoms. Around one in three people with COVID have no symptoms at all, but they can still pass it on to others. And I know that nobody wants to be responsible for endangering those around them. So I urge everybody involved to get a test. We surge testing in Leicester. We surge testing in Liverpool. We know that community testing can work. And it requires a collective spirit of determination and of resilience and of people coming together to do the right thing, something I have confidence that everybody involved will find in the days to come. This sort of community testing deployment is not just available in Kent, Essex and London, where cases are rising, but also across the country to help keep cases coming down where they are. We're now working with over 100 local authorities across England and with the three devolved administrations to help get cases down using community testing. This includes Manchester, Kirklees, Lancashire, Lancashire are planning to mobilise community-based testing in their areas before Christmas, as are Manchester and Kirklees. And this offer remains available all across the UK to be done in partnership with local authorities and devolved administrations. We can deploy this sort of massive testing because of the work that NHS Test and Trace have done so effectively to build our vast testing capacity. Our new NHS Test and Trace business plan, which we published today, sets out how we'll grow this yet further. And today's figures on testing and tracing show that thanks to the improvements in the way that we do contact tracing, by reducing the number of repeat calls that are made to individual households, which has one of been, been one of the pieces of feedback that we've received, our contact tracing now reaches 86% of contacts. And that's up from around 60% just a few weeks ago. So I want to pay tribute to the contact tracing team working under Dido Harding for delivering this very significant improvement. And from today, I can confirm that people instructed to isolate by the COVID-19 app and are eligible can claim the £500 test and trace support payment directly through the app too. Even as we work to overcome these challenges, I'm determined that we also lose no time in modernising our hospitals. So uh, today I can also announce 1,800 projects which are being funded from the £600 million package to upgrade and refurbish hospitals across 178 NHS trusts this year. Uh, this will include projects uh, for fixing roofs, for new MRI machines, 
And these projects that will be completed over the winter period will make a real difference for staff and patients alike and help the NHS to build back better. These announcements that I'm making today show just what a massive effort is needed every day to tackle coronavirus, even with the vaccine on the horizon. I'm very grateful to all those working in schools, in local authorities, delivering the vaccine rollout, our pharmacists, NHS Test and Trace, and the Hospital Improvement Programme for all the efforts that they need to deliver on all of this. It shows that every part of our NHS, from GP surgeries to hospitals, every part of government, local and national, is all playing its part in the battle against this virus. We've got to remember in this battle that we're all on the same side. And especially with Christmas coming, there's something that we can all do, which is to respect the rules and all of us at all times do all that we can to stop the spread of the virus. This is a marathon, not a sprint. We've got to keep going. The finish line is in sight, and I know together we can get there. We're now going to go straight to questions from the public and then questions uh, from the media uh, to, um, uh, to uh, Professor Witte, Professor Powis, uh, and myself. Uh, first, if we turn to Phil, who is coming by video from South London. Good afternoon. What are the exit criteria that will see the end of the tier system? If it is vaccination, what percentage of the community or population need to be vaccinated for us to exit the tiers? Thank you. Thanks, Phil. This is a great question, and it's one I'm asked a lot. So I will try to answer it at high level and then turn to the Chief Medical Officer for more detail. The simple answer, Phil, is that we will keep looking at the five indicators that we have for uh, deciding on which tiers areas need to go into. And whilst we roll out the vaccine, we'll look at the impact of people having been vaccinated, uh, the impact that has on reducing the number of hospitalizations, the number of cases, the number of cases in the over 60s, the positivity in the testing, and the trajectory of all those indicators. Uh, because it's by reducing the number of people in hospital and by reducing the number of people who die from coronavirus, that the vaccine will help us to get out of this. So I can't answer the part of the question, which is what percentage of the community or population need to be vaccinated for us to exit the tiers, uh, because we don't know yet the impact of the vaccine on how much people can transmit the virus. So what we'll do is watch the data that we look at now, and the vaccine will, of course, I hope, very much uh, suppress that data in the months to come as we roll the vaccine out to more and more of the population. Chris. So um, what I'd add to that is that the vaccine will over time, as it spreads uh, through a greater and greater percentage of the most vulnerable population, uh, the vaccine will take the risk slowly down. Firstly, we'll start to see some of the uh, mortality uh, fortunately falling because the most vulnerable would be va vaccinated first. But that will still leave a lot of people who, if they catch COVID, a significant proportion, small proportion, but a significant given the numbers, will end up in the, in, uh, the NHS and potentially could become unwell uh, or severely unwell, end up in intensive care. Um, and so to get through all of those uh, people will take quite some time. Now, this assumes that the vaccine just protects people from severe disease and from uh, COVID infections themselves. Uh, as the Secretary of State has said, the thing we don't know is will, will, this vac will the vaccines we have available reduce the transmission on? Our expectation is it will, but uh, that is not certain yet, and we can't be absolutely uh, sure of that. And depending on whether it does and what percentage it does, will uh, will actually lead to trying to work out what percentage of people need to be vaccinated for us to make significant uh, forward steps. But, and there's the final but in this, uh, we won't have a situation where we're in the tiers as we are at the moment and then suddenly everything stops. What will happen is the risk will gradually go down and down and down. We'll be able to walk backwards from many of the things we're doing at the moment, possibly at different rates in different parts of the country. Uh, and at a certain point, the, uh, the risk will be at a, at a level which society, uh, represented by our, our political leaders, 
uh, and uh, in Parliament, uh, will say, look, this, this level of risk is one we are prepared to tolerate. Uh, as we do, for example, with flu. So you've got to remember that with flu, uh, there are, in any given year, on an average year, about 7,000 people die a year of flu, uh, and in a bad flu year, maybe 20,000. That's the reason we vaccinate, but we accept that there is some risk. At the end of this, there will be some risk, but we'll have brought it down to a level where the mortality rates are much lower, where the, there isn't the risk of the NHS being overwhelmed, uh, and when people feel, look, this is probably the right moment uh, to actually take them right down to very, very low levels in terms of the restrictions we've got. But it'll be a gradual process, not a sudden process. Thanks very much. Thanks for that, asking that question, Phil, because I know a lot of people are, uh, have been looking for the answer to that question, and uh, I, I think uh, the Chief Medical Officer set it out brilliantly. Uh, the next question is from Kate from Dudley. And Kate asked, New Year's Eve is a special time for some people as much as Christmas is. Will we be able to spend it with our close family members? Well, Kate, the answer to the question uh, is yes, if you live with them in your household, uh, but we are not bringing in a special set of rules for New Year as we have uh, for Christmas. Uh, I know this has been such a tough year for so many of us, 2020, and so we've brought in the rules around Christmas uh, to make sure that people have that opportunity to be able to see uh, some members of their family who they haven't been able to all year, uh, but we've got to be careful, and let's not blow it, especially with the vaccine on the horizon, uh, and let's make sure that we all take the actions we need to to look after other people and to look after especially those who are vulnerable to the disease uh, over Christmas. And um, th we therefore haven't put in place a, uh, a set of, uh, a specific set of rules for New Year uh, or indeed for lots of other holidays uh, that, uh, that, you know, and special occasions uh, throughout this, uh, this crisis uh, just for Christmas. So I, I know that that's frustrating, but unfortunately it's necessary to keep the virus under control. I don't know whether you want to add anything. Thanks very much. We'll now turn to Hugh Pym from the BBC. Thank you very much, Secretary of State. A question for you and, and Professor Chris Whitty first. Um, how concerned are you about this increase in cases in the southeast, which relate back to infections a week or so ago, when lockdown was still in place or just ending? And how likely is it that you'll move London and Essex into the top tier, top three, when you carry out your review next week? Thanks, Hugh. Well, in answer to the second part of the question, we'll look at the data, the most up-to-date data we have on the 16th, so next Wednesday. Um, of course, we're looking at it all the time, but that's the moment we'll take a formal review and a formal decision. And so I, I don't think it's right to preempt that decision. Uh, we publish all of the data that we're going to be looking at, and we've explained the five indicators. Um, and you know, these, are, these decisions you know, are, we, are, are what we think is necessary to keep the virus under control on the broad strategy of suppressing the virus until the vaccine can make us safe. Um, so having set out the, the strategy and setting out the data that we look at, uh, you'll understand uh, it's, it's six days to go until that formal decision has been taken, and we'll want to, I don't want to preempt that uh, by saying more about the specific decision on the 16th. However, having said that, of course, um, we do look at the data daily, and, um, uh, and as I said in my opening comments, uh, we have seen those worrying rises uh, in, uh, in, in not just in, uh, in London, in other parts of the southeast and east of England as well. Um, I mean, of course we're concerned, and of course I think anybody uh, who's living in those areas is going to be concerned. Throughout this, there's this very difficult balance where if we uh, don't do a sufficient number of things, the rates start to go up, and this is the period of the year when, for all respiratory viruses, rates go up. And you can see this across Europe. This is not something which is unique to uh, England or the UK. This is, a, this is a, across the whole of the continent. Uh, and... Uh, in the areas in the north and the Midlands in particular, where people have done a remarkable job of coming together to uh, re meet the restrictions, stop doing social activities that are not necessary, reducing uh, contacts, they have managed to bring the rates down. They've been falling right 
really quite consistently uh, in the northwest and northeastern bits of the Midlands, but they've not been falling in some of the areas where we've had lower uh, restrictions in place, in particular parts of London, northeast of London in particular, uh, uh, bits of Essex and Kent. Uh, and this is also true, actually, in, in, in some parts of Lincolnshire as well. Uh, and therefore, we need to look very seriously at these areas and, and ask the question, is there an, it, it, are there enough... Uh, measures going in uh, or, or do we have to have more and that's something which ministers will have to look at next uh, week but I think if these rates were going up towards the tail end of lockdown that is quite a concerning situation uh, so I think we need to actually keep quite a close eye on that because we all know the Christmas period if people go too far in the Christmas period it's going to be a period of risk everywhere so if you add the rates going up difficult time of year Christmas period and then going into the toughest time of the year for the NHS, January and February are always the toughest time for the NHS, uh, that does uh, paint quite a concerning picture. I'll, I'll ask, if I may, uh, Professor Powers to comment on the NHS side as well because in the same way that we've seen this absolutely uh, fantastic reduction in the daily case rate in parts of uh, the north of England and some parts of the Midlands, um, and indeed in the southwest around uh, Bristol, uh, where people, I just urge everybody to stick at it because they've been doing a great job and I know there have been sacrifices uh, in those areas, but um, the pressures on the NHS are coming down and um, everybody should you know, feel that they have been playing their part in bringing their case rates down. We're now seeing them go up in, in other parts of the country. Um, and obviously having to address that, including the pressures that that brings to the NHS. Yes, Hugh. So, so as you know, hospitalisations follow infection rates very closely. And so in those areas of the country, as the Secretary of State has said, where we have seen infection rates fall over the last uh, month or so, so the northeast, the northwest, Liverpool in particular, we've seen hospitalisations fall, the number of people in hospital fall and pressure on hospitals fall. Uh, but we've also seen in parts of the country where infection rates have not fallen or indeed are rising, uh, pressures remain on the NHS or start to rise. And that's particularly in parts of London, uh, in east of England uh, and parts of the southeast. And, and where infection rates are at the highest, such as the northern parts of Kent, we are seeing a lot of pressure on the NHS. So as ever, yes, there is concern when infection rates stay high or are rising because that inevitably will lead to more hospitalisations more people in ITU and, of course, tragically, more deaths. So it is critical that we continue with the measures to bring infection rates down uh, and ensure that those numbers start to fall. Thanks, Hugh. Next question from Tom Clark at ITV. Tom. Hi. Thank you, Secretary of State. Um, given what we've just heard from Professor Witte, is it not inevitable that we're going to see a dangerous third wave in cases now and if that is the, going to be the case shouldn't we act sooner rather than wait till next week to make a decision on further restrictions and if i could also ask a question about your uh the testing program that you've just announced i don't believe you specified the type of test going to be used um if it is lateral flow test there have obviously been questions raised about how effective they have been at reducing overall cases where they've been deployed so are you confident for the school testing program is going to make uh, the difference you need it to make? Well, the, in a way, I'll, answer, I'll try to answer both questions and then ask uh, uh, Professor Witte to, to uh, respond as well. Um, we're, we're doing everything we can to try to keep the case rates down, and that does include sending in uh, community testing. And in particular, because we're seeing this very specific rise amongst a particular age group, 18, uh, 11 to 18 year olds, um, and particularly in northeast London, we're therefore sending in the mobile testing units and the targeted uh, testing, and I look forward to working with, uh, with the schools, and we're already working with the local authorities in that part of London uh, to, uh, to try to find and then uh, isolate those who are tested uh, positive. Um, the, um, and, and that can help us and can play a part in keeping case rates down, but only as part of an overall uh, package where, uh, big, where it's individuals' behaviour that make, can make the biggest difference to uh, keeping case rates down. Um, so these decisions are not inevitable. The decisions on tiering uh, and the measures that need to be taken depend on how people respond and how people behave. 
you know, and we've seen in parts of the country where, um, where, where people have really responded to the need to tackle very high case rates. Um, Professor Powers just mentioned uh, Liverpool. It's also true that in other parts of, uh, uh, of the north of England, the case rates are really coming down sharply. Uh, Manchester, for instance, we're rolling out community testing there as well. And on the specific types of testing uh, you asked about, um, in the first instance, we'll be, we'll be using PCR tests uh, in London because the mobile te units are, uh, are ready to roll, and we'll also be rolling out uh, lateral flow tests. They're both effective. Uh, they, have, they, they have slightly different characteristics, can be used in different ways, uh, and um, what, you know, the lateral flows, of course, don't need to be sent off to a lab, so they have that advantage. Uh, the PCR tests do, uh, but they tend to pick up uh, more of the disease uh, even before people are uh, symptomatic. Uh, so uh, we'll be using a combination, but in the first instance, the, what we'll be doing uh, this week and next week in uh, northeast London is largely uh, with the, with the lab-based PCR tests. CMO. Um, I mean, I, I just really reiterate the point that a third wave is not inevitable, but it is the way that we prevent it is by everybody, all of us, coming together and actually deciding we want to try and stick to the guidance that's there and, you know, accept that Christmas is a period when we can do things. That's the reason why the rules have been relaxed. That doesn't mean we should do things. People should really be very, very sensible over that period and over this whole uh, period at risk because this is a very risky period for us, but it is definitely not inevitable uh, that things will get uh, substantially worse. Uh, that's something we need to all work together on. On testing, I think that, what, as you imply, the key question is not just testing, it's how they're then used and how people respond to them. Uh, a testing programme is a useful addition to other things. On its own, it is not capable of turning the tide if things are going very badly, but as an additional thing to all the other measures, all the social distancing measures, all the uh, NPI measures, all the things people have to do in terms of keeping their distance, wearing a mask indoors. If you add it to those things, it adds an additional bit of heft, and that's what we've seen uh, in many places around the world, but it does mean the right people have to come forward for testing because it's only useful when it picks up people who are positive. Uh, and then those people have to uh, take the guidance seriously, self-isolate, make sure that if they have contacts, they also know about it and they self-isolate. If we do that, it pulls out of the system people who currently are infectious and means that they don't go on unknowingly to pass this on. Because there are, there are, the, the thing where it really helps, this kind of testing, is there are some people who have no symptoms at the moment they don't realise they've got COVID, it's not their fault, but they have got COVID, and for a period either before they get symptoms or even if they don't get symptoms, they can pass it on. And what the testing can do is it can say, look, you feel fine, that's good, but actually you've got this virus, and please isolate, because if you isolate for uh, a period of time, that protects everyone around you, and then everyone they go on to meet, it helps break a chain of transmission. So testing is very useful, but only if people then act on the results. Thanks very much. A next question from Victoria MacDonald at Channel 4. Thank you, Secretary of State. Today we have seen the publication of the interim findings of the Ockenden Review into the Maternity Care at Shrewsbury and Telford NHS Trust. It makes for a very painful read, but equally importantly, it calls for immediate action in maternity units across England. Will you personally agree, uh, agree uh, act, sorry, will you personally um, agree that these need to be acted on immediately? Yes, the Ockenden report is uh, shocking reading. And uh, we've already taken the actions that were proposed in an earlier part of the report, and we'll, of course, study the proposals that have been made uh, in the report very, very closely. I'll ask uh, Steve Powis. Uh, to set out more details, uh, and, uh, uh, and, and I know how, uh, how closely the NHS has been uh, monitoring this to make sure that we take the actions that are needed to make sure that maternity services are safe. Uh, thank you, Victoria. Yes, and I, I too uh, welcome uh, uh, Donna Ockenden's uh, report that was published uh, today. I know just how painful and harrowing it has been uh, for all the families uh, who have suffered from the shortcomings in maternity care uh, at that trust uh, and clearly offer my sympathy to all of them. I, I met uh, some of the families uh, last year and uh, that meeting really moved me and really affected me and I, I understand just what they, uh, they have gone through. Um, when 
although it's of course impossible for anybody who's not been affected to, to know exactly um, what they've gone through, I should say that. But um, I think, as Donna said in the report, um, there are two things predominantly that, that they want out of this. Firstly, is to, to understand what went wrong. And then secondly, to ensure that the learning from what went wrong can be acted upon. And, and I do hope that uh, Donna's first report today goes some way towards answering those two questions, although clearly she has more work to do and will publish a final report next week. And yes, I do think it is very important that the recommendations uh, for the Trust are acted upon immediately, and I know uh, the Trust has been working hard to improve maternity services, but they have further work to do. Uh, there are also seven recommendations for the wider system when it comes to maternity care uh, and at NHS England, NHS Improvement, we have been uh, working on those already. We haven't waited for the report, but clearly there is more work to be done uh, as well. Uh, so um, I think this is an important step, uh, but uh, clearly we now need to act on those recommendations. Thank you very much. The next uh, question is from Rajiv Sayal at The Guardian. Rajiv. Hello, Secretary of State. Uh, this question for you. Your uh, former neighbour, Alex Bourne, is supplying millions of test tubes for NHS COVID-19 test kits after sending you a personal WhatsApp message offering his services. Did you discuss Mr Bourne's offer of help with anyone in your office or your department? And if so, would would you be prepared to release any of your communications with Mr Bourne? Thank you. Thank you. I, I've read about this uh, in The Guardian. Um, I, I had absolutely nothing to do with that, uh, with that contract. Uh, and um, what I'd say more broadly is that I'm very pleased that so many people came forward during, that, during the spring of this year when we really needed the nation really needed the support of huge numbers of people, whether they came forward to uh, supply PPE uh, or, in this case, to supply some of the supplies that go into the, uh, into the testing kits. Um, and I'm very grateful to all of them. And, um, but, uh, but I'm afraid all, I can't answer any more than to say that I had nothing to do with this uh, particular contract at all. Thanks very much. The next question is from Dominic Yateman at the Metro. Hello, Health Secretary. Um, if, as seems possible, the failure to reach a Brexit agreement means Britons are banned from travelling to Europe under their coronavirus regulations from January the 1st, will Britain reciprocate and what bearing would that have on infection rates? And secondly, if I, if I may, um, Dr. Emily McWhorter of the Royal College of Nursing told MPs today that at the height of the crisis, PPE was routinely relabeled with uh, new use-by dates. Much had rotted in its boxes, and she herself opened a crate of gowns to find a load of insects creeping out. Would you like to apologise to frontline, frontline staff for what they had to work with? Well, uh, firstly, on the, um, on the international travel question, we make uh, judgments and decisions on uh, what international travel can be recommended and, and how many people, and, and from what countries or parts of countries uh, you have to quarantine based on public health advice. That's the approach that we have, and that's the approach that we'll be sticking to. Um, the, uh, on the second question about PPE, look, there was a massive effort, uh, as in fact the uh, previous question implied, there was a massive effort uh, involving a huge number of people, including the RCN, actually, who did brilliant work coming forward and helping to ensure that we could get the PPE supplies that we needed. And I'm really, really pleased uh, that so many people contributed and there was never a national outage of PPE. Now, that doesn't mean that it wasn't difficult at times, uh, and there were undoubtedly challenges. Um, but we had to move heaven and earth to deliver the amount of PPE uh, that we did uh, to the system. Um, and now, I'm glad to say, uh, we have over 30 billion items of, uh, of PPE. Um, and we also have developed, we've also developed the uh, domestic manufacture 
uh, so that we won't be reliant on getting it in from abroad so much in the future. And um, a, a very significant proportion of the future supplies of PPE, for instance, the sort of gowns that you mentioned, uh, can be manufactured uh, domestically to make sure that we're in a much better place for any uh, future crisis like this one. Uh, the final question is from Stefan uh, Boskia at City AM. Stefan. Thank you, Secretary of State. Um, is there any plans at the moment to reopen the Nightingale Hospital at the Excel Centre, considering London's surging COVID rates? And secondly, is there any point in putting London's hospitality sector in Tier 3 for what would be just four days in the lead up to the Christmas period, considering the damage that this would have on a sector that's already on its knees? Well, obviously, I understand the impact of the decisions that we make and the tiering decisions that we make on different sectors of the economy. Um, but we have to make them in order to keep the virus under control. And we've all seen the consequences of what happens if the virus gets out of control in other countries. Thankfully, here, we've protected the NHS all the way through. So the NHS has always been there for you if you've needed it. And that's been absolutely at the heart of our, of our goals. Um, I'll ask uh, Professor Powers to uh, explain uh, what's happening in London uh, in, uh, to make sure that the NHS in London uh, can deal with the pressures that it's, uh, it's under. Uh, but that's the approach that we take. And look, I get it from the, the, the point of view of the hospitality sector. Of course I do. Um, uh, the Christmas rules specifically uh, don't actually affect the uh, approach to the hospitality sector. They're about who you can meet up with uh, in your own home. Um, and so it's about the rules about who you can meet with rather than the rules about whether hospitality is open or not, which continues to follow the, the approach in your local tier uh, over Christmas. That's unchanged by the, by the Christmas rules. But on the NHS in London specifically. Yes, so as you know, the Nightingale hospitals have been our insurance policy throughout this pandemic uh, to ensure that if uh, NHS capacity is stretched, uh, that we have additional capacity on stream to be able to use. And uh, again, in the first wave in the spring, we used the Nightingale uh, in the Excel Centre in the London. Uh, those Nightingale uh, hospitals have been kept uh, over the course of the summer and into the autumn. And indeed, uh, as I announced here uh, a number of weeks ago, we, we stood up the ones in the north uh, of the country as we saw infection rates rise uh, in that part of the country in particular and of course the pressure on the NHS following and indeed we've been using uh, the Nightingale uh, Hospital in Manchester. Uh, in London uh, we are seeing uh, a worrying right, rise in infections. I said we are seeing pressure in the NHS particularly in the east of the city uh, but we're not uh, at the levels that we saw in April uh, and therefore we can manage within existing hospitals in London. And of course our first step uh, in managing capacity is, is mutual aid between hospitals. We have the ability to move patients between hospitals, uh, from hospitals that are pressured to those that have less pressure, and also we can, we can uh, move staff and equipment too. Uh, but the Nightingale is important. Uh, we are keeping it under review, and of course we can also, we're also keeping under review uh, different uses for the Nightingale in London. Uh, so it's really important that we uh, don't see further rises of infection rates in London and we don't see pressure rising on the NHS, uh, but the Nightingales will be there uh, as that insurance policy if we need them. Thanks very much, everybody. That concludes today's coronavirus briefing here from Downing Street. Thank you.